Was it the girlfriend? Was it an angry ex? Or was it the brother? One murder victim, three suspects. Who done it? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Sammy Wheeler. Viewer discretion is advised. <laughs> Samuel Edward Wheeler, who would go by Sammy, he was born on September 4th, 1956, and he was actually born with a twin brother. His brother's name is Danny, and they also had another brother named Tommy. It was the early morning hours of June 7th, 1992. At the George Washington National Forest in Virginia, a vehicle is found in the parking lot with a shattered window. When the people who noticed it looked inside, they found a body. A man had been shot to death inside the vehicle. This man would later be identified as 36-year-old Sammy Wheeler. Sammy Wheeler owned the 1988 Isuzu Trooper that he was found in. He was also in a sleeping bag. He had been shot, I believe, at least six times. It was more than evident to police that whoever did this was trying to clean up this crime scene, and, and they actually did so pretty successfully because they wiped away all potential fingerprints. They found no prints. There was no additional DNA found at the murder scene. There were no shell casings found at the crime scene, so the killer picked them all up and took them. And they also found that there was like a piece of paper or a cloth shoved into the uh, uh, gas tank with a lit cigarette or a had been lit cigarette in the paper. The killer was obviously trying to burn the cigarette to eventually ignite the gas, which would then burn the car and would destroy any evidence, but it didn't work. Initially to police, this looked like a random act of violence, but they would soon learn that Sammy's life leading up to this moment was well, full of issues. And so three suspects would emerge in the murder of Sammy Wheeler. Those suspects would be his own twin brother, Danny, Sammy's girlfriend, Pat Sneed, and Pat Sneed's estranged husband, Bob Bean. Danny, Pat, and Bob would spend many months of this investigation literally saying, I think they did it, I think she did it, I think he did it. They would change their tunes. Look, I don't think this he did it anymore, I think she did it. It was just them constantly pointing fingers at each other and constantly saying that each other, they were telling police that the other person was lying, this person's lying, that person's lying. It was a convoluted mess. So in the fall of 1991, Pat Sneed moved into a condo that was actually owned by Danny. And this is located in Staunton, Virginia. This property had separate apartments into it. And so Pat Sneed moved into one of the apartments where Sammy would stay with her there. And Pat had two kids from the previous relationship. And they were also living there temporarily with Pat. And then Danny himself lived in another apartment in the same building. At first, everything was fine until Bob Bean found out about all of this. And Bob had issues with Sammy living with Pat and his two sons. So Bob Bean approaches Pat and say, listen, uh, I don't like this situation. I don't like this Sammy guy living with you. Can you please not have him live with you? Pat's like, no, I'm dating him. I'm actually going to be getting married to him. And so no. <laughs> So Bob Bean says that he had to then, he says he was forced to go to court to basically get the courts to not have Sammy live with them because he didn't want them living in an immor immoral living situation, whatever that means. And unbelievably, in 1992, it worked. Bob Bean actually successfully got this done. Sammy Wheeler was not allowed to be in the presence of Pat Sneed while Pat had the two kids. So whenever... The kids weren't with her, they were with Bob, Sammy could be living with her. And in situations where the kids were there, uh, Sammy, who had nowhere else to go, slept in his car. He lived in his car, just outside the building. 
Sammy had actually at one point tried moving in with his brother Danny, but I guess this was still not good enough for Bob. Bob actually had people like a private investigator spying on the situation and taking photos, and that's how Bob was finding all of this out. And Bob said to them, you're violating this court order. And Sammy's like, no, we're not. I'm I'm in my brother's apartment. I'm not, I'm not in the apartment with Pat. And he didn't believe it. And so and even though Sammy and Pat were both like, no, he isn't living here when the kids are here, Sammy still decided to, all right, I guess I can't even live in my brother's apartment, so I'm going to just move into my car and sleep in there and live in there, uh, kind of off the property. Bob Bean would later tell investigators that at one point he sat down with Sammy himself and said, I want to tell you what you're getting into with Pat. Bob was trying to say he was like the good guy here, that, you know, Pat's not good news for you. You should maybe not be in this situation at all. But Sammy would say that Bob Bean was not a trustworthy guy. He was always lying. And he said he felt that Bob Bean was capable of doing just about anything to get his way. And then one morning uh, at like 530 in the morning, Sammy is leaving or he's getting out of his car or doing something. And he sees this teenage boy taking photos of him. And it turns out that that teenage boy is actually Bob Bean's son, who Bob asked to go to the to that apartment building and take photos of Sammy. And Sammy approached him and said, hey, can you not do that? I'm not violating any orders here, so stop it. <laughs> And then it was within like a day or so of, of those photos being taken, Sammy gets into his car and he drives up to, or his plan is to go to Elkhorn Lake, which is like 40 miles away. He's gonna go fishing. He's gonna kind of go off on his own. 12 hours later, he's found brutally murdered inside of his vehicle. So one of the motives that Pat and Danny were saying that Bob had was that Bob was upset that Pat left him and there's like this custody arrangement and he just didn't like Sammy. And so he, Made, you know, Bob killed Sammy to get him out of the picture. And it was a crazy coincidence because the divorce between Bob and Pat was literally like a couple, like a day or so prior to the murder happening. And then Pat and Sammy were going to be getting married literally a couple of days after the murder happened. However, Bob Bean had an incredibly airtight alibi. Bob was a part of the Army National Guard and he was doing maneuvers that night with them and he was on duty until 11 p.m. As a matter of fact, one of the police officers who was kind of involved in this case is also part of that group. And he says, yep, I definitely saw Bob Bean there. And yeah, he definitely was there until at least 11 p.m. The camp that Bob Bean was at was 150 miles away from where the murder took place. The coroner ruled that Sammy Wheeler was likely dead by at least one o'clock in the morning, which would have meant that it would have been physically impossible for Bob Bean to leave that location where he was at and get to that campsite, shoot and kill Sammy Wheeler, and then, you know, get back to his place. It was just impossible. He couldn't have done it. But Danny's like, okay, well, maybe Bob hired a hitman. Obviously, that's what happened then, okay? So, sign, seal, delivered, arrest him. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, you need proof for that, too. And they investigated Bob Bean's financials. They looked into his bank accounts. Any financials he had, there was absolutely no evidence that he took money out or paid anyone or transferred money to anyone. There was nothing. There was absolutely no way he paid a hitman. Because if you're going to hire a hitman, you're paying them a pretty decent amount of money. And there wasn't like cash taken out or anything. And so eventually they cleared Bob completely as a suspect. But then Bob tells police, well, what about Pat? She didn't have an alibi for the murder, not a clear alibi at least, because Pat's alibi was that she was just home that night with her kids. That was it. He claims that his two sons began to talk to him kind of flippantly in passing about Sammy's murder. And they, the kids were describing the murder scene and what Bob says was in pretty incredible detail as if they were there or they saw it. And so he, I guess, recorded them talking about this, the kids, and I guess he showed it to police. But there's also this thought that he could have coached them to say these things. They could have just said those things because they've heard about it, because they're kids. You know, it's it, this interrupted their lives too and then they knew what happened that wasn't exactly proof that pat did it so police who saw that video of the kids just dismissed it as being it's unreliable we like we can't use this because there is a very good chance those kids were coached 
As a matter of fact, the kids also said they were home that night with their mom. Pat was cleared as a suspect. Then Bob and Pat both start pointing the fingers at Danny, his twin brother. Bob was the first one to point fingers. There's only two things that can come between brothers, twin brothers that I'm aware of. It's money and a woman. That's all I gotta say. I, you know, I don't offer anything. I'll let somebody else make the accusations. After Bob says, well, maybe it's the brother, you know, there's there's this, he thought that perhaps Danny was in love with Pat and maybe Pat was in love with Danny. Uh, and so he thought maybe that was the motive for Danny to kill her, his brother. And then Pat was telling people that she said she overheard that someone was telling her that Danny confessed his love for Pat and that he wanted to be with her. He thought she was beautiful. He would go out on some mysteries and say, actually, no, I didn't think she was good looking at all. Uh, and he said that was complete bullshit. It wasn't true. I had no desire to be with her. And that was definitely, that. so that wouldn't be a motive for me to kill my own brother. Pat also said that there was, the way Danny reacted, because Pat and Danny were both told together by police that Sammy had been found murdered because they were, you know, they lived in the same building. Pat says that, Danny reacted way too big like he was like super like angry and screaming and he he got a shotgun and he said I'm gonna go kill Bob Bean because I know Bob did it and she thought that that was a complete over-the-top reaction almost as if he was trying to show it up to the police to show he didn't do it that Bob did it but again people react in different ways he's allowed to be angry that his brother was just brutally murdered you know it's that's that's not a sign of guilt <laughs> So you've got all of the three of them pointing fingers at each other. They're all saying how this could be the motive, that could be the motive, you know, yada, yada, yada. It's all just back and forth and it's just a humongous mess. But police are able to kind of individually clear all three of them. The FBI gets involved and they confirm that the three of them are not likely suspects in this, that this was actually more of a random act of violence and and they were kind of stuck with that for some time fast forwarding to march of 1998 this case airs on unsolved mysteries around that time or sometime before that danny then hires a private investigator to please look into this you know i i need my brother's murder solved i need to know who did this i guess bob found out about a potential individual and so bob tells the private investigator you need to look at a man named kirk thomas bell because i think he confessed to being there when Sammy was murdered. Well, who is this guy? He had no connection to them. He didn't have any connection to Sammy. So the private investigator flags him down. So he says to the private investigator, well, on the night of the murder, I was hanging out with my old high school friend. His name was Guy Price. They were driving around drinking. They were intoxicated that night. They decided to drive to Elkhorn Lake, which is where Sammy was going. So apparently a drunk Guy Price then pulls into the parking lot where they just so happened to see Sammy's vehicle parked there. He, I guess, takes out his dad's 3030 rifle and he just randomly starts shooting at Sammy's car. Then they approach the car and realize, oh shit, there's actually someone sleeping in this car. He's like, I think I just shot this guy. And so they go into the car and they pick up all of the shell casings and they wipe down everything. They get back into the car and they start driving away where Guy Price takes out his gun and starts shooting at another random person on the road, but he misses that person and he ends up shooting and killing a cow instead. Price then tells Bell, because Bell was driving, you need to drive back to the to that guy's car because I need to make sure he's dead. And so they do. And this time he takes out a 22 caliber. He goes to the car and he points it directly at Sammy's head and he fires it one more time into his head to make sure that he was dead. Mr. Bell says, I never came forward to police. I knew I knew that this was the guy that we, you know, that was killed that night, but I was terrified of Guy Price that he was gonna kill me. He threatened me and I, I don't know if I came forward, what would happen? And he was afraid he was gonna be charged with the murder as well. So as the FBI is looking into this, they confirm a lot of the story. They have witnesses who say, yeah, we actually saw that vehicle, the vehicle that Price and Bell were in, driving around that park right around the time that Sammy would have been killed. They also, just so unbelievably, they actually went to that field where that cow was shot and they actually found a shell casing there, unbelievably. That shell casing matched guns they found on Guy Price's property. 
So in July of 1998, Guy Price is arrested and charged with murder and also for the crime of shooting towards that other vehicle on the road. At the trial, it's learned that Kirk Thomas Bell was actually at a friend's house the night the episode of Unsolved Mysteries aired, and he was drunk, and he confessed that he was there during the murder of Sammy Wheeler, that this was a random chance encounter, that everything they were saying on the episode to do with all these three people, it was none of it had to do with nothing. And that's kind of how eventually it got back to Bob Bean, and then Bob Bean started with the investigator to go look into him. But Guy Price was found guilty of the murder of Sammy Wheeler, and he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole until 2012. He was denied parole in 2012, in 2017, and 2019, but in 2020, because of all the issues with the COVID pandemic, they actually ended up paroling him, and he was released from prison, and his whereabouts at that point became unknown. Kirk Thomas Bell was never charged with anything to do with the murder. I do believe that he was charged with trying to starts the fire in Sammy's car, but I, it doesn't sound like anything really moved forward with that. And so essentially he was the key witness at the trial and he got off with it. He didn't commit the murder. It sounds like they had enough evidence to show he didn't actually shoot and kill Sammy. You know, it's really kind of debatable whether or not he should go to jail for it. If he was there for it, didn't say anything, but he was terrified for his life, he says. So who knows? But in the end, it had nothing to do with the three people. It had nothing to do with dr the drama back at home. It had nothing to do with ex-lovers and ex-husbands. And it had nothing to do with a uh, brother who wanted to sleep with the guy's girlfriend. It had nothing to do with any of it. All of it was nothing but red herrings, basically. But they finally came to the truth. And thankfully, Sam, Sammy Wheeler, was finally able to get the justice he rightfully deserved. But that is it for this case, True Crime, a Rooney Dooney Dingleberry Dongs. As usual, please subscribe to the channel if you're into true crime. I tell true crime stories several days a week. Also follow me over on TikTok. I tell short form true crime stories over there every single day on two different pages. The links to both pages are in the link tree in the description of this video below. You'll also find my merch store in that link tree. We ship all over the world if you want to check it out by all means do so. And lastly, if there's a case you want me to cover, just send me a really quick email. My email is listed below. Just send me the name of the individual or the case, where it happened and when it happened. I'll add it to the list. The list is gigantic. I pick the cases I cover each time at random, so I can't promise you when I'll cover that case, but I will cover it eventually, I promise. But that is it for this video, True Crime Aruni. So until the next case, ta-ta for now, True Crime Aruni's. Mm. Mm-mm, mm-hmm.